Thank you very much, Dr. Fouad. Thank you, Mr. Fouad. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here with this exclusive club. Over, I don't feel a foreign body among them because we are uh, working together uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, the issue. Yeah, the printer, Uh, when you ask someone what's early greater cancer, you have to have a clear definition so that we talk the same language. Uh, the trouble with this word is about definition, by the way. Uh, and then the second, oh, sorry. And then the second, what's the gold standard of treatment? And the next question, which is a surgical question, what's the DME, which uh, uh, the total mesorectal excision, which I'm going to discuss a little bit further. And obviously, it's not my privilege to talk about even any role for new adjuvant therapy for patients with early rectal cancer. And next is is there any role to treat them effectively and efficiently with chemo radiation? And then we can discuss if there is any other issue which uh, would be raised. This slide, I think everybody is aware of it, but defining the end-director cancer, as everybody knows, is T1 and 0. Some people may add something like, uh, they may add something like T2 and 0. And here we start now to get a little bit of a problem of definition. So T1 and 0. Some say T2 and 0. Which T2? And the, the, what's T2? It depends on literally on how far we are going through the muscular problem. From the perspective of patients, the most important layer is the submucosa layer. Muscularis mucosae and submucosa are rich on blood and lymphatic vessels. So Passing through this area, probably you will get positive beam fluids. And this is why we say T2, even if it goes through the muscle, superficial, it's less likely to be uh, uh, without lymph node. I'm insisting on lymph node because to have a control surgically, you have to get the lymph node out, basically. And if you don't get the lymph node out, our colleague will tell you this is not a right? So, T1. Is it all the time without lymph node? That's a question. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So we get into now a little bit of dilemma. In the past it was very easy. A, B, C, and end of the story. But look at this now. The Japanese study, they're very specific about lymph node. They tell you that how far the tumor has gone into the submucosa and dividing this area into three categories. And they tell you that the probability in the very superficial or within the mucosa of having lymph node is zero. As it goes down into the submucosa, before reaching the muscularis mucosae, the probability would be around 80%. So here we start really. Is it 80%? Is it any erectile cancer? But according to the definition, it's not. So all our efforts now for obsession, surgeons, oncologists, radiologists, whatever, is just to define the flows. So we have to have some modalities. Everybody is aware about endorectal ultrasound, and it's been quite extensively used. It's good. To delimit the layers within the lumen. It's good to tell me that the depth of uh, involvement of the tumor up to the muscle layer and beyond the fingers. But how accurate we are for lymph nodes? This is the question. Second, you know that the endorectal ultrasound is operated with the finger. Be careful. If I miss the train with lymph node, then I miss the train with early rectal cancer. That's, that's the dilemma which we have to, to go through. MRI, is it accurate? Yes, it's accurate for tumor, 95% most of the time. 
very different patients. But what about influence? That's where the problem is part. So we have all the time this dilemma, image versus histology. And to be honest with you, most of the time, I will sympathize. Is it clear I don't just here? Not yet. OK, good. I sympathize with them. And they tell me precisely, we don't have a histology. We can give you image only, but not histology. Histology is another area. But there are certain characteristics <coughs> of here and there which can tell whether there is really lymph node involved in the mouth. Is the lymph node are less than 8 millimeters? Is it spiking or not? Is it regular or not? What are three lymph nodes coming together or not? That's subtle things which can improve the prediction, and I think it's very important. This is a sort of the different literature which it tells us. What's the indirect ultrasound? It tell me the depth reasonable, but lymph node may be not as reasonable as perhaps the MRI. But there isn't really anything concrete now to tell me that there is or there is no lymph nodes. It's obsession now, lymph nodes. I'm talking about obsession because the answer is not kind of Generally speaking, the accuracy, uh, the, there is a limitation of the uh, rectal cancer regarding nodal status. The direct ultrasound, they may get me up to 70% with error, positive or negative. You know, that adds a little bit more dilish, uh, dimension. Because of the dimension of the lymph nodes, we have a problem with the definition and we have a problem with the management. What options of management we are talking about? The gold standard is surgery. You go to everybody say surgery. But surgery is exactly like what well, a problem. But which surgery? There is two ways now to can do the surgery. There is a radical resection, and then we have to pronounce the anus. Now, if you do a radical resection, there are several ways to do it. Open surgery, laparoscopic surgery, or robotic surgery. I'm not going to talk too much about robotic surgery, but I'll put two or three indications for it. If you got early rectal cancer, be careful. And you can go all the way, particularly for very, very low tumor, to preserve the sphincter in male who's happened to be thin, because the pelvis is a little bit different. Here, robot, robotic surgery can be of good. So we have the resection and we have transaerial resection. Transaerial resection it sounds very reasonable proposition, particularly when we talk about tender cancer. Makes sense. Now let's go to the radical surgery. In order to understand radical surgery, what we have to do? Any surgeon, even radical work, besides the surgeon itself in that regard. You have to do what you call the total mesorectal excision. What's that mean? It's big names, but simple. We have to go back to our life as embryo. The gastrointestinal tract is just a tube and it's got a mesentery. It retains some of the mesentery in the small bowel and in the colon. But as it goes down into the rectum, the peritoneum, see, there is complete little bit of uh, fascia, and there is no mesentery anymore. But if you go, for example, you call a resection, right hemicolectomy, the first thing you ask, did you take the mesentery with you? The answer is yes. And why take the mesentery? Well, this is where the implant is. So it makes sense is to try to figure out where this vein, where the mesentery is, we will have as a surgeon to go through it or what sometimes is being called the holy plane in order to get the specimen with the lymph node. And you can see this is holy plane is going in the back here, it's going in the front. You can see this peritoneal reflection and sorry, I'm not you know, most of uh, my residents they don't like the medical, although they are surgeons. Uh, and one of them, once upon a time, he told me, uh, I asked him a question about anything. He said, precisely, 
ولا عيال البلاد وكتب بغداد اللي دايس معناتها فناو ام فيلينج ا ليتل بيت انكمفورتبل وين اي توك اباوت اماكن زي ما بتجلس ليتل بيت شوفها anyway so you can see here that's the level and that's what you have as a surgeon to do in order to get the specimen with the lymph node what the specimen looks like the very interesting thing is you have it, it looks like in there's an envelope around the specimen and even if you look at the back of the specimen here it's smooth this is the definite plane not all the cells are aware of it but it's a definite plane you have to go for it and if you go through that plane it's amazing there is no passata and get quite a good, good kind of uh, section the most important thing you get all the lymph nodes and you get a good sample but anatomy anatomy and anatomy and have to know who those planes without knowing those planes you have a problem the point is very important the pathologist once they get the specimen they will be in a position to tell you oh this plane has been violated you don't have to talk about any influence now because that plane is violated once the plane is violated you can't say this is radical By the way, just only to give credit to that gentleman, uh, he is a surgeon, single-handed, back in 89 to 99, he showed beyond pure adventure and were using sort of resection without the whole thing, that he's got the best prognosis surgery pain because he identified this pain until now the uh, uh, heat plane. Another thing about heat plane, which is important, that plane, you can see here behind this plane, there are nerve supplies, which are very important for definitely male set of our patients. So if you go beyond this plane far to the sacrum, you may damage these nerves, and you go a little bit forward, you don't go through the plane and you violate the lymphatic supply. Then comes the question, okay, now we're going to do a resection open versus a prospect. The issue is about laparoscopy. We started laparoscopy back in 89, sorry, 89, 87. None of you were born, but I was there. Somehow the laparoscopy went to into all areas. But there was one paper came from Sweden about laparoscopy for colon cancer, and we detected considerable number of anterior abdominal wall seeping. And what had happened? From 1990 to nearly 2000, nobody would dare to talk about laparoscopic resection of colon cancer. We were scared. But gradually, we discovered that this paper was not really the right paper. And gradually, we start to say, well, laparoscopy becomes the standard rather than open surgery. Obviously, laparoscopy, you will have a sort of shorter stay in hospital, less post-operative complication. Uh, both laparoscopy and open, they have some downside. You have to respect it. And these downsides are really serious. You might have urinary dysfunction, you might have sexual dysfunction, bowel dysfunction. We almost, almost forget when you talk about surgery, there are downsides of surgery. What about SSR, surgical site infection? What's about uh, 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 pain? What's about long term? Well, this is something I'm hammering with my colleague here. It's about incision and hernia, which I found how good that the literature is amazing. You get stoma and incision and hernia later. Most of the patients who may require surgical treatment you have to tell them that they may require the stone. And if you are T1 and very low down, you may end up losing your uh, sphincter. So this is all issues uh, we have to address. Uh, this is very busy slides, which I thought I'd be like the colleges. Put a big slides, too many numbers, get them confused, <laughs> and then I'll be one of the members of the club. Sorry about that, but it's simple. What do you look at? Comparison between lab, uh, lab, uh, sorry, lab uh, colon uh, resection for 
very, very fragmented when open. I think the same for now. Length of stay of hospital, more or less the same. But you can see that in early phases, when you come to 2005, the hospital stay was longest. But now the hospital stay is getting less, I'll show you that in a minute. The overall morbidity of the proscopy is less than open. Makes sense. Particularly for surgical site infection and so forth. The question came is it oncologically sound or not? And the answer to this is local recurrence rates are comparable as well as survival rate is comparable among other parameters. So the proscopy is now having a little bit of better uh, age. Recovery is quicker, less complication. Uh, conversion. We have quite a lot of conversion rate, but as the learning curve for everybody is going very really high up, the conversion rate from the first to open is getting less than uh, this one. Hospital stay, there is a concept here even, I don't know, I won't read it according to this, it's called the RAS, enhanced recovery after surgery. And with this enhanced recovery after surgery, you can do the operation on Monday and we discharge the patient as early as Thursday or perhaps on Friday, Saturday. So less than one week compared to open, which we do in our case in seven, 10 days. It has got an advantage. So just to sum up, I think laparoscopy may be the better way. Now, this is a small tumor, it's T1, guys. Shall we go for something simple? Yes, we can go through transanal. And then through transanal process, there are two ways to do it. It doesn't matter how. But at this time and age, what we do is microsurgery, special equipment, special instrumentation, you supplement the rectum exactly as if you are doing the supplementation of the abdomen, and you can do the resection. You have to make sure that this is T1 and 0. It'd be tragedy if someone with this early tumor, you make an infinite and you have a problem. You can go for surgery with this section all the way even into the muscle, all the way into the, uh, into the wall of the rectum. Has to be a good thick size. Has to be one centimeter all around, which is clear. You have to get it in a pen and get a picture of it, and like this one. And usually, the, 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 the operation is relatively quicker, simpler, however, has got problems. You have to select your patient very carefully because you don't want to leave to receive it in a piece. You want to fix chunk as complete chunk. So, tumor less than three centimeters, you have to make sure, sure, sure that we still have no lymph node. And then <coughs> people start to play games about this one. We have to define or refine our selection criteria. If there is a probability of a vascular invasion, blood vein invasion, or include invasion, then perhaps it's made to selection. Vascular and lymphatic invasion. If they are there, then probability of lymph node involvement will be high. Differentiation, we said good differentiation rather than good differentiation. Very low tumor because the outcome will be better than abdominal perineal resection. Elderly age group because you might not stand for radical resection. So if you have a selection which is good, you have careful selection, you may end up missing something like 4% of the patient with positive lymph node. So it's an attractive option, transrectal. Everybody thinks that this is maybe something in the future, but there is less complication of the urinary bladder, less complication to the bowel, but you have to be careful with cases. You can't do it for everybody. It had, by the way, transcendental had a very bad reputation historically because people were not selecting the patient. We talk about T1, T2. Some patients with T3 were operated the same way. Lymph node was missing right left and center. Local recurrence was high. And 
five years and why that was not doing really great. So it had got a bad reputation. But I think with advance of energy technology, particularly in terms of size and defined energy fields, it could be something uh, reasonably useful. But the question comes, tell me, how often do I see a patient three centimeter region T1 and zero? You know, meet me halfway. Yes, but often, not saying no. But how often do you see that? Actually, in, in the European and uh, in, in North America, we talk about maybe 70 to 20% of the old population patients. So the numbers are really terribly small. That leaves us with one option, ready for search. Sorry about that. New management therapy. I feel ashamed just to talk about the management therapy of oncologists here. Yeah. But there were trials about that. And one trial, for example, uh, which was stopped by the American College of Surgeons, Oncology Group, they went into phase two, started with the patient all new hydrogen oxide plate and on top, and everybody get complications, years for a central complication, serious complications, and said, no, oh, we'll stop this trial. However, on the other side of the Atlantic, there was another group, they worked into five FU in the and something. It didn't get a good uh, uh, outcome. However, it was a little bit of something interesting that there was downsizing of the uh, uh, downstream of the tumor size, 46 percent, uh, and there was something like 12 percent or 16 percent, 15 percent of the tumor. That's an area which perhaps in the future we look at it more carefully. Why this population will vanish if you want to do in radiation and other hormones? But that's all in the trial phases. We haven't got a conclusion or a strong conclusion regarding this uh, one. I think the adjuvant therapy for T2 and 3 was really shown that perhaps it's the advantage, this advantage is not that great. Now, if you do this one in T1, T2, here you go. So, so Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, the any cancer of rectum, T1 in zero, have to be very precise in zero. Local cancer might be low in. <coughs> Uh, selected patient, particularly for local assessment. New adjuvant therapy is not recommended for timing, and defensive approach is still incoming. Thank you.